Well, hi, everybody. Welcome to the Firewall. I'm Bill Whittle, and once again, it's Christmas in America. So, Merry Christmas, everybody. And what better time to talk a little bit about America and Christmas and how the two fit together? You know, there have been mountains of pages written about just how religious America's founding fathers really were, both as a group and as individuals. And I'm not going to argue about how Christian these men were or weren't, or whether or not you should be religious or not. That's none of my business. But listen to this subtle and recurring theme. Our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people. It is wholly inadequate to the government of any other. That was John Adams in 1798. Charles Carroll, a signer of the Declaration of Independence, writing in 1800, without morals, a republic cannot subsist any length of time. They, therefore, who are decrying the Christian religion, whose morality is so sublime and pure, are undermining the solid foundation of morals, the best security for the duration of free governments. And then, of course, there's this, from one of the greatest and often cited as one of the least religious of all the Founding Fathers. Can the liberties of a nation be thought secure when we have removed their only firm basis, a conviction in the minds of the people that these liberties are a gift from God, that they are not to be violated but with His wrath? Now, that was Thomas Jefferson speaking in 1781. So, what are these men really saying, and how does it affect our secular society today, which is home not only to Christians, obviously, but also large numbers of atheists, agnostics, Jews, Muslims, pagans, Zoroastrians, Scientologists, Jedis, and all the rest? Well, it's actually very simple. At its behavioral core, Christianity is the belief that each believer has living within their own heart a divine presence which provides a template of compassion, tolerance, forgiveness, and redemption. It restricts our base impulses to cheat and murder and steal, and the force that constrains and inhibits and governs, governs our lives is not a set of rigid external restrictions on behavior. It is an internal morality. Now, that's exactly what John Adams meant when he said that our Constitution was made only for a moral and religious people, people who the government could essentially leave alone, since they would, by and large, govern themselves by their internal moral and religious values. Now, that is a very different kind of society than one based upon Sharia law, for example. Under Sharia, you're required to pray five times a day. You're told how to wash, what to eat, and how to dress. And a rigid effort is made to remove all, all temptations. They're just simply taken off the table by the society. The very idea of freedom of action modified by internal self-restraint is antithetical to Islam, at least Islam as it's practiced through Sharia law. Now, non-believers will argue that morality and self-restraint can be produced without religious belief, and that is absolutely true as evidenced by the decency, reason, and civility of millions of Americans of non-Christian faith or of no faith at all. But see, this is where it gets a little deceptive, because those foundational Christian values are baked into this culture, which is why American Muslims are far more moderate than those in the Middle East, and why the people of post-Christian, atheistic Europe, who don't seem to believe in anything, are being displaced by people who do. And it's also true that everywhere you look in the modern American culture, there is a growing wave of nihilism, a burning hatred for the very idea of morality, of right and wrong. Well, you see, there's a very serious problem there, too, because people who don't know the difference between right and wrong tend to be real... Well, I don't want to offend anybody here at Christmas. Uh, Keith, why don't you give us an archaic word that makes you think you're really intelligent? Mountebank. Mountebank! Perfect. You see, sooner or later, when you have enough of these mountebanks running around, people start laying down more and more laws to stop all of this mountebankery. Not just in big things, little things too. Whenever we don't govern ourselves internally, there always seems to be somebody else ready to do it for us. So this Christmas, let's give at least a little thanks to the idea of a spark of divinity that lives within us, that disciplines and governs our worst excesses from within so that other people don't need to do it from without. Because a society like that is free. Free to have a place like Las Vegas, where you can do all of the whoring and drinking and gambling you want, or not. It's up to you. You're an adult. You're free. And now, briefly, a quick word about modern American Christmas. You know, Santa, the mall, the stress, the materialism, all of that. Yes, there are excesses. Of course, freedom does that. But what's really going on here? 
Well, what I see are people who've worked hard and who are taking some of the excess wealth that they have generated to buy things to make the people they love happy. How horrible can it get? You know, America is, I think, the only nation in the history of the world based not on need, but on desire. Desire. Not greed, not lust, not obsession. Those are different things. That's why we have different words for them. I'm talking about desire. We live in a nation of desire made up of self-selecting people who wanted something, not just needed something, but wanted something, something better for themselves and their families. A place where nothing was guaranteed, but in exchange, a place where everything was possible. You know, when I was seven, I lived within easy walking distance of the beach where I grew up in Bermuda. And like everybody else back then, when it came time to shop for Christmas, we used the printed internet, which was known as the Sears catalog. Now, this, my friends, is a Voyage to the Bottom of the Sea playset, and when I saw it in the Sears catalog one day, I about lost my mind. Every day after school, I came home and I just stared at that page in the Sears catalog. I wanted it so badly that as November dragged along, I tried to build a sea view out of cardboard and scotch tape, which actually doesn't work so well in the water. So I had to wait. And since he sees you when you're sleeping and he knows when you're awake, for those three months anyway, I became a very, very, very good little boy. I modified my own behavior internally out of desire. No one had to say boo to me. Now, a few years later, I was in a camera store and I saw one of these. It's a reflecting telescope. I saw the mirror at the far end. I saw how beautifully the gearing and the tripod and the eyepieces were made. So I made an end run around Santa and went straight to dad, who said that if I worked for half of the money, he'd pay the other half. So I did. And while I was working and waiting and wanting, I bought A Field Guide to the Stars and Planets by Donald Menzel and taught myself where to find star clusters and nebulae and galaxies. And the first night with that telescope, which I not only had to want, but earn, I saw Saturn floating there, just a little BB in the middle of its perfect ring system, and I lost my mind again. So, Merry Christmas to all of you self-governed, decent people of all faiths or lack of them. Whether you realize it or not, Santa has brought us the very best present of all. Life in a nation of desire, a landscape where dreams can come true, at least for boys and girls who know how to be good. Merry Christmas, everybody.